In the previous lectures in this section, you've learned about BGP from the point of view of a service provider. And the reason for that is that you really need to look at it from that point of view to understand why we have BGP and how it works. But for the CCNA exam, you don't actually need to know how to configure BGP in a service provider environment. That's covered on CCNA service provider, but not in CCNA routing and switching. What you need to know about BGP for CCNA and for the configuration questions you might get in the exam is how to configure it from the customer point of view for an enterprise. So that's what we're going to cover in this lecture here. You'll see why an enterprise would use BGP because very often they won't, they'll just be using static routes. And when they are using BGP, I'll show you how to configure it as well. So as you saw earlier in this section, ISPs or internet service providers connect to other ISPs. And because of that, they have to use BGP for internet routing. BGP is how routing works on the internet. Enterprises, however, that are connected into ISPs can use either static routes or BGP for their internet connectivity. If you do enable BGP at the enterprise, that increases the load on the routers. They have to do more work. And it also increases the load on the administrators that are looking after those routers because it's more complicated to configure BGP than it is to use static routes. So looking at the topology that we were using earlier in this section, we've got five service providers and they've got customers that are connected into them. And you see that each customer is just connected into a single service provider with a single link for internet connectivity. So looking at it from the customer's point of view, if a customer does have that topology, there's only one path in and out for each of the customers that we had there. So there's no need to use anything more complicated than a default static route. In the example there at customer one and the customer one router connected to the ISP, we would do a default static route. So IP route 0.0.0.0, 0.0.0.0 pointing at the service provider, which is 203.0.113.1 in our example. And from the service provider side, they're going to have a route going to the customer. Maybe that's in their IGP, or as we've got in the example here, using a static route. So from the provider, IP route 203.0.113.8, 255, 255, 255, 248. That's the customer's public IP addresses. And the next hop is 203.0.113.2. So you see when we've got just a single link from the customer going to the provider, very simple configuration. And that topology will sometimes be acceptable for small offices, but larger offices are probably going to want redundancy for their internet connectivity. They might have some mission critical services, but it's really important for them that the internet is always up. Maybe it's just really important they've got internet access for browsing. Also, maybe they've got remote workers or remote offices that are VPNing in into that site. So for them, it's going to be important that the internet is always up. In that example topology, there's a single link between the customer and provider. So that single link is a single point of failure. So if we want to eliminate single points of failure, we can put in redundant links between the customer and the provider router. So now we've got two links, 203.0.113.0 at the top, 203.0.113.4 on the bottom. So on the customer, we configure two routes. IP route 0.0.0.0, 0.0.0.0, 0.0.0.0, so a default static route pointing to 203.0.113.1, and we do another same default static route, but this time using the other link, going to 203.0.113.5. And at the provider, we'll have two routes for the customer's network of 203.0.113.8 slash 29. And it will point to 203.0.113.2 on the top link. And let me just quickly edit this on the fly because I noticed an error there. So, I duplicated it. So 203.0.113.2 along the top path, and it was .6 on the bottom link there. Okay, so that 
is fixed now now when we do this all traffic to and from the customer travels via a single service provider via a single as so there's no need to configure bgp it's all going in and out through the same service provider default static route equal cost load balancing will spread the traffic equally over both links if we go back a slide i've got two routes that are exactly the same destination o dot o dot o dot o one's going to 203.113.1 the other one's going to dot five for equal cost so half the traffic will be going over both links and if a link fails all traffic will go over the surviving link so if a customer has got two links going to the same provider recommended way to configure it would be just like that with a pair of default static routes now hopefully it was quite obvious there that we've still we've still got a single point of failure we've put in two links between the customer and the router but they're on the same routers so if that router fails we're going to lose access so the router is also a single point of failure so hopefully it's quite obvious what we're going to do here we're going to just split it out into two routers at the customer and two routers at the provider and the config is going to be the same other than that apart from rather than being two routes on the same router it's going to be split over two routers so we've got customer 1a and customer 1b routers a default static route on both and i've got the same typo in here again so let's just change that to a six on the bottom and that is our config fixed okay so exactly the same as it was for two links between the same router now we've just split it into two different routers and so because the config is really pretty much the same the scenario is the same the result's going to be the same so same thing here all traffic to and from the customer travels via a single as again no need to configure bgp the pair of default static routes will do equal cost load balancing across them so half the traffic will go over either link and if either link does fail or, or any router fails then traffic will go over the other surviving link so at this point we've eliminated all physical single points of failure for the connection between the customer and the provider if we go back and have a quick look at it again you see we've got two routers at the customer two routers at the provider and we've got two links there as well and at the provider they've got multiple redundant connections there too so there's no single physical points of failure anymore so for all of those there was no need to implement bgp so you're maybe thinking well when would we need to implement bgp then looking at it from the customer point of view and where you would is the service provider itself as a whole is a single point of failure they could have a physical or operational issue which drops their internet connection and you've got two connections but they're both going through the same provider if the provider goes down then you've lost your internet access now that is a lot less likely than a physical link or a physical router failing but it's still possible it's still a consideration because of this some providers will offer redundant physical internet connectivity paths meaning the provider will guarantee you that we're giving you two completely separate physical paths there's no single physical point of failure in our network if anything goes down your internet connection is going to stay up and that does completely cover you for a physical failure either with yourself or the provider but still there could be an operational failure like the service provider could go bust i know it's not very likely but it is possible so because of that some companies prefer to be connected to two completely separate service providers two separate physical connections as well to give them the best redundancy so now you can see that customer one over in the bottom left in the example diagram here they're connected to sp1 and they are connected to sp4 as well and now there's no single point of failure for that customer and at this point when the customer is connected to two different service providers they have the choice of either using default static routes again or they can use bgp for their internet routing if they do go the 
way of using static routes, the benefit they get from that is it's very easy to implement and support. So it's the simplest way of doing it. And it's really going to be the same configuration here again. So we've got customer 1A router, a default static route pointing to one provider, and then on the other router, a default static route pointing to the other provider. And at the service providers, they'll have routes going down to the customer as well. But there is a drawback with this. If I go back to the diagram again, if we look, for example, traffic going from customer one to customer five, all traffic going out is going to be load balanced over the top path via service provider one and also over the bottom path via service provider four. So half of it will take the top path, half of it will take the bottom path. For traffic that takes the bottom path, that's going through AS65004 and AS65005, so two ASs. But when traffic goes over the top path, it's going to go AS65001, AS65002, AS65003, and AS65005. So traffic is going to be quicker, as long as the, the paths are the same bandwidth everywhere, it's going to be lower latency when traffic goes over the bottom path than when it goes over the top path. But if we use static routes, half of it's gonna go over the top, half of it's gonna go over the bottom. So we don't have the most optimal routing here. So that's why we would maybe want to use BGP. If we use BGP at the customer, it's going to learn the best paths, the shortest AS path everywhere. So we are going to be getting optimal routing there. So like it says here, alternate method is to implement BGP between the customer and the service providers. If you're going to do this as a customer, then you'll want to acquire your own BGP AS number from the internet authorities and provider independent IP address space, meaning these public IP addresses are yours. They're not like leased from a service provider. That is quite likely not going to be possible for IPv4 now because all the IPv4 addresses have been given out. So it might be difficult to do it for IPv4. It'll be easier to get it for IPv6. Doing that enables optimal routing. The drawback is that it's more complicated. So it puts more workload on you, the administrator, and also it puts more work on the routers as well. So you see that when the customer configures this, they've got their own AS number. This is for customer one down in the bottom left corner. They've got AS65010 and they are peering with both service provider one at AS65001 and service provider four at AS65004. And they're gonna advertise their own public IP addresses of 203.0.113.0 slash 29 with BGP to both of those providers. For traffic coming in, it will take the shortest AS path. And also for traffic going out from them, that will take the shortest AS path as well. So they're gonna get optimal routing now. For actually configuring this, you see that the customer, they've got two routers. One router is connected to SP1 and another router is connected to SP4. So we're going to need eBGP from our own AS to the provider AS from both of those routers. Also, those two routers will have an eBGP relationship with each other as well. So looking at the configuration, the first one, R1, We've got router BGP 65010, the customer's AS number. Neighbor 172.16.0.2, remote AS 65010. So we can see that's the IBGP relationship with the other internal router. And then neighbor 203.0.113.129, remote AS 65001. That's the BGP relationship, the eBGP with the provider. Then we need to advertise our own public IP addresses out. So we say network 203.0.113.0, mask 255.255.255.248. And then we do a matching configuration on R2 down at the bottom, pointing at the other IBGP router and also its eBGP neighbor as well. Okay, so that was the full config. Really, we covered that in the previous lectures. For verifying it, it's going to be the same commands again. So show IP BGP summary to check that the BGP neighbors come up, show IP BGP to check that the routes are making it into BGP as expected, and then show IP route to check that they're actually making it into the final routing table and going to be used. 
Okay, and last thing to tell you here is about BGP filtering. Because the global internet routing table is huge. There's over 600,000 routes already and it's still growing. And that many routes would overwhelm many enterprise class routers. BGP filtering can be used to only advertise or only accept a subset of the entire BGP table. That allows for optimal routing where it's most suitable and a default selection for everything else so that you don't have too many routes in the routing table. So you, that is very common to do filtering with BGP, both at the customer and at the provider as well. So at the provider will typically implement filtering also to prevent a customer accidentally advertising the entire internet as being available through themselves. Obviously, the customer wouldn't want to do that, but it's possible that they could. So the provider will have BGP filtering rules to say only accept routes from the customer that we would expect to be getting from them. Okay, so that is BGP for enterprises and how to configure it. See you in the next lecture where you'll see how BGP is also used in MPLS networks.